This video is brought to you by Macarena. This Saturday, my fiance Kenzie and I will get married because you're not just my subscribers, but you're also my dear friends and you've been supporting me for so long. And it's also thanks to you that we could finally achieve this. I would love to invite you to join the streaming live. I'll give you more details on my community tab tomorrow, so keep an eye out. Thank you. What do you think? Do you see any Romans around? Any Romans around here? No? Strange say, Roma Invicta. Roma Invicta. <laughs> hey Noble Ones, welcome back to my channel. This is the Metatron speaking and I've been seeing this idea going around in the media, uh, whether it be on Facebook or even on some YouTube channel, of the Romans or the possibility that the ancient Romans were the first Europeans to ever set foot in the Americas, whereby uh, not only that would have happened before Christopher Columbus and Amerigo Vespucci, so the sort of late 15th century kind of very famous explorers, but also a thousand years earlier than the Vikings themselves. Now, as much as a very intriguing idea this is, it is very important to always keep in mind that oftentimes sensationalism and misinformation go hand in hand, and professionalism needs to be brought into the field if we want to make sure that we really entertain this idea with interest, but also with realism. So today we're going to mention a few sources, of course Pliny the Elder being one, but also some historical extant examples, archaeological evidence that in theory should prove, at least according to some people on the net, that yes, the Romans did reach the Americas, but not only did they reach them, they even started an actual sort of back and forth trade. Not only iconography, but statuary, archaeological evidence, DNA evidence would back this up, in theory. We're gonna jump right into it, but one thing is important. Remember this, exceptional claims require exceptional evidence. Do we have it? Well, we will find out after a brief word from our sponsor. And now me and Winston would like to take a moment of your time to mention the kind sponsor for this video, Mechareena, a new third-person really fun mech shooter. The game is great for both friendly and competitive mode play, it is free to play and it has all sorts of game modes, fast-paced PvP 5v5 matches and much more. One thing I love about this game is that it has an awful lot of mechs that you can unlock, upgrade and customize, including both weapons, skins paint jobs, and all of that can be played on a variety of maps and game modes. You gotta choose the right mech for you, so you can be strong, but with style. Also, check out all of these different weapons you can choose from. Mech Arena has just launched its new pilot feature, which is making the game much more tactical and strategic, which is jolly good fun. And on top of that, Mech Arena is adding another pilot and a brand new mech to the game this month. So what are you waiting for? Not only the game is free to play on both Android and iOS, but you can use my personal link or scan my QR code to get one Steel Reaper skin, 500 A-coins and 70,000 credits to help kickstart your game. Also, feel free to add me to friends and we can play some matches together. So don't wait around, link in the description and big thanks to Mech Arena for sponsoring this video. Welcome back. The first thing we're going to address is the pineapple. If the Romans had access to pineapples, in other words, if there are representations of pineapples in Roman art, wouldn't that be a proof of a communication, some sort of constant, continuous trade between ancient Rome and the Americas? Well, you see, the pineapple is indeed a tropical plant with an edible fruit, the pre-colonial cultivation of which has an origin estimated between southern Brazil and Paraguay. It was both domesticated and cultivated by the Aztecs so all the way up to modern-day Mexico, which means that it's basically an American plant, Mexico being in North America rather than just South American. It's American. So, did the Romans have it? Well, according to a couple of YouTube videos, yes, there is evidence based on the book written by Elio Cadello, a book I strongly disagree with. But what evidence are they talking about? Where are these pineapples represented in Roman art? For a more detailed explanation, I suggest a wonderful video made by Europa Antica. Well, there is one mosaic and a couple of statues that are usually used to back this idea that pineapples were common in the ancient classical world. This mosaic up here and these two statues. Now, of course, I'm going to examine this right now with you. Two main principles are very important while we try to assess classical antiquity and its art. First, we need to use Occam's razor. 
I'll tell you what that is in a minute. And second, whenever we look at the past and its images, we need to be very careful because we all have a tendency to recognize images and patterns that we as modern people are familiar with. In other words, simply because that fruit looks to us modern people who are well accustomed to pineapples, even though that looks like a pineapple to us, it doesn't automatically make it a pineapple. The same way as this looks to us as if it's a laptop, but Clearly, it wasn't. And the idea of projecting one's familiarities as a modern person can be a very dangerous endeavor. That looks like a laptop to you and me. That was loud. So what is it? First, it could be a pine cone. Here is the thing, pine cones were exceptionally and extremely common on Roman tables. We know they were present, they are mentioned all the time. Given, people will say, but pine cones don't have the leaves that usually we see protruding from the top of this whatever it is. Well, the Romans were all about aesthetics. Why couldn't they use a piece of branch from a pine cone and make it into a composition. A second possible explanation is that it's a different kind of fruit. Perhaps a fruit coming from Asia or Asia Minor, or perhaps even from India. To give you just one example, perhaps the pandan fruit, which kind of resembles, in a way, a pineapple, Given this is a fruit of the Pacifics, um, it's a fruit more common in Polynesia or Micronesia. But then again, we do know that the Romans did push east. They did go all the way to India and, and they had contacts with India and Persia. And here is where Occam Razor comes in. Occam Razor is a scientific and philosophical rule whereby entities should not be multiplied unnecessarily. This means that Occam Razor requires that the simplest of competing theories be preferred over a very complex one. In layman's terms, what's more probable that the ancient Romans managed to go all the way to the Americas with the sort of ships that they had that definitely weren't as seaworthy as late medieval caravels, that they acquired pineapples, probably stealing them since there are no coins of Roman coinage ever found in America, whereas Roman coins have been found in the Middle East and in India, that they managed to go all the way back, established a constant trade, bring all the pineapples back to Rome, put them on a plate, represent them on a mosaic, but never mention them. Not once. Or that these images do not represent pineapples, but either pine cones, which were extremely common, or some other sort of exotic fruit. Of course you might think, but would the Romans really mention something as silly as a pineapple? No need of any razor there. Absolutely. Pliny the Elder has a huge chunk of his 15th book where he tells us all about all sorts of fruits and plants used by the Romans. Marshall on his 13th book tells us again with extreme detail about the fruits that the Romans were commonly using and even the uncommon ones. He tells us how important, for example, apricots were because they were exotic and oh wow, you got an apricot. Lucullus brings back the cherry from the city of Kerasunte and for the Romans this is such an important piece of information then they even name cherries after the city of Kerasunte in Latin Kerasus and that's interesting because in modern Italian we say ciliegia but in Sicilian dialect which you could say it's not really a dialect of Italian but it's a dialect of Latin if we really want to be honest about it in Sicilian dialect we call them cerasi the Romans documented everything they were extremely detailed about fruit plant and all sorts of cereals and yet nothing about pineapples or any possible fruit that could be interpreted as such zero Another thing that has been brought forth as quote-unquote evidence of this supposed journey of the Romans in America are the letters written by Christopher Columbus himself, or Cristoforo Colombo, to the Spanish crown, specifically to Queen Isabella. How are you, Queen? You all right? As we know, Christopher Columbus made several, numerous trips to America and he wrote several letters because he was trying to keep the crown informed. And in one of these letters he says basically that the sovereign of Castilla never had sought land outside of Castilla itself, but that this world, the one where he's navigating to, the same that even the Romans, Alexander, meaning the Great, and the Greeks sought to conquer. The problem with mentioning this passage is that once you bring this forth, you either do it because you're being intellectually dishonest, because you know what's going on, 
I'll tell you in a second, or you really have no idea what you're reading. And I don't know which one is the worst. Everybody who has looked even superficially into the history of Christopher Columbus and the late 15th century sort of navigation and exploration towards the new world knows that Christopher Columbus had no idea that he had reached America. He didn't know that America was there. In fact, when he tries to convince the Spanish crown to let, give him basically the money and the support and the ships in order to begin this journey, his destination is India. He thinks he's going to India. He believes he can circumnavigate the globe, but he didn't know that there was another landmass in between. And so he thinks that if you start going west, eventually you'll go all the way around and reach India. And that is one of the reasons why, even to this day, the misnomer American Indians still exists. And that is also why it's more correct to say Native Americans, because they're not from India. But the name Indians to refer to Native Americans comes from the fact that Columbus called them Indians. And he calls them Indians all the time throughout all the letters that he writes, all the way up to the very letters of the fourth and last voyage. He had no idea. When he mentions that even the Romans, Alexander and the Greeks sought after or tried to obtain, he refers to India. And again, that's an easy read, it's a no-brainer. He literally calls it the Indies and India throughout all of the letters. It was another explorer, Amerigo Vespucci, after Colombo, that actually realized this is a new landmass and he realized that this is a new world, hence, you now call it America, after Amerigo. If Christopher Columbus had realized that that was a new landmass, you would be calling it Colombia. Instead, what do you call Colombia? The state in the south of America, which was named after him indirectly. It's more of a 19th century name that they came up with, but enough about that, I don't wanna go into too many details. But yes, Christopher Columbus was absolutely referring to India. So. What did he mean when he said that even the Romans, Alexander and the Greeks tried to conquer? Of course, the Romans reached India. There was Roman presence in southern India. Did Alexander the Great reach India? Absolutely. The area belonging to India that Alexander the Great invaded was called the Land of the Five ri Rivers or Punjab. Absolutely crystal clear. Anyone who understands late 15th century history understands that he's referring to India. Okay, here is another one. You might have heard of a specific ancient Roman shipwreck called Relitto del Pozzino. We're talking about a Roman vessel that sunk out of the coasts of Tuscany in 120 BC. The contents of the cargo were actually fascinating. Archaeologists were able to find all sorts of ceramic vessels made to carry wine, glass produced in Palestine. But what was the most important part connected to this video was a medicine kit. Inside a chest that unfortunately was basically destroyed, archaeologists found 136 wooden vials, surgical hook, a mortar, and most importantly, several cylindrical tin vessels. And as they examined them using x-ray, they noticed that these vessels still contained what seemed to be tablets. Now this was significant because not only it brought back an idea of medicine and tablets produced of several ingredients mixed up together that we didn't think went all the way that far back in the past, but it also the fact that these tablets, even though we're talking about the bottom of the ocean, they were preserved dry because these tin containers were not broken. Obviously a thorough chemical analysis was conducted on the tablets and that revealed their contents. What were they made of? Zinc compounds, iron oxide, starch, beeswax, pine resin, possibly olive oil, an array of ingredients. And some of these tablets even resembled basically vegetable stock being made of leek, carrots, broccoli, cabbage, onion, parsley. The connection with America is the fact that as an advanced DNA test was performed, traces of sunflower were also found. And sunflower being again an American plant that was not believed to be to have reached Europe until the 16th century, then again, this would be a proof that sunflower would have been common, hence the Romans went to America. You see, this is an old article and it's an old discovery, but what it is known is that this idea of sunflower was completely debunked. One of the people who participated in the actual excavation and went underwater told the researchers that him, he and his team had, before going underwater, had placed their, part of their gear, their equipment, including their oxygen tanks, on a 
flowery on a flower field right next to where they were living and as you can imagine this field was a field of sunflower hence this is not proof that the romans knew sunflower it's proof of forward contamination the site was contaminated by the subs going underwater now you see there are a lot of points that I'd cover but I think the video is getting already quite long. For example, people mention this statue specifically and they say this was found in pre-Columbian temple therefore it being of Roman origin then it must have meant that the Romans went to America and yet most people know now and it has been said that this was an actual prank made by an archaeologist to other archaeologists within their team, a student probably. And then again, even if it wasn't a prank, the simple fact that a Roman object is found in America doesn't automatically mean that the object was placed there during the Roman period. It could have been brought during the Middle Ages and left there for whatever reason. It, radiocarbon doesn't tell you when it was placed there, it just tells you where it, what, what period it was made. But one thing I'd like to say before closing the video, and that is, it's not that I'm saying that it definitely didn't happen, that the ancient Romans reached America. I'm not saying absolutely it didn't happen. I'm saying maybe, who knows? I mean, at the end of the day, when we reached Mars with the latest exp expedition, I wouldn't have be, been surprised if we had found a Roman scutum there, considering how amazing conquerors and explorers they were. All I'm saying with this video is, do not let people convince you that it is highly likely that the Romans went to America using these sort of hints or clues, if you will. We do not have enough evidence to support this thesis. It's just a possibility, it's an interesting thought exercise, but this is not enough evidence. In fact, it is quite scant. Anyhow, I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please remember thumbs up. And if you're not yet members of this community, become a noble one. Subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. And don't forget to check out the video game Macarena, the, also the sponsor of this video, using my link in the description or using my QR code. Thank you very much for watching. And remember, the Metatron has spread its wings. See you on Saturday.